seeing people come in over the next five, ten minutes. Uh, yep, so I'm starting to record now. Thanks for the reminder, Bart. Um, I guess. Um, Bart already had one question already. I don't know if you caught that, uh, Bernie. What's Yes, should we uh, start answering questions now, or uh, um, do we need to wait for uh, 6 o'clock when everybody's... It, it's uh, up to you, man. I mean, we already got two people online. Um, Arb, Arb is online as well. Okay. Yes. Um, well... Do you, do you want to wait? I mean, I could keep telling my quant, world-famous quant jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can tell one, and then we can start. <laughs> why, are, why, why are quants lucky to have the kind of jobs they have it's um, because they look at models all day uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay well, all right, all right then. <laughs> yeah we got we're starting to see everybody come in so uh, I unfortunately with my go to meeting I have to cap it at uh, at uh, 30 okay uh, so I'll keep you guys unmuted. Okay, um, so we could start now. We've already got seven people, because everything's being recorded as they come in. We can just do a whole onslaught of questions as we uh, have people come in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we, yeah, we can certainly start, yeah. and I will uh, look at uh, Pat's uh, question first. Okay. Um, what is the most important factor or performance measures uh, that I uh, take into account. Well, um, you know, I certainly uh, look at the average returns, sharp ratio, maximum drawdown, and maximum drawdown duration. Uh, these are the, uh, the four uh, performance measures. You know, s some of them measure the sort of the normal performance, some of them measure the tail risk, and, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, they give me a pretty good picture of the strategy. Um, I don't know that, uh, well, to rank them, certainly uh, the sharp ratio and the maximum drawdown is uh, most important. Um, out of many markets like Forex, futures, option stocks, which one is most suitable for running algorithmic trading? I would say that, uh, well, actually all of them are. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see that, uh, uh, you know, there's one market that, uh, or the other that, uh, that's not suitable for algorithmic trading. Uh, all, all of them are. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so what we're doing for everybody that's new, uh, I think Bart had, uh, I'm just trying to play catch up here. Anybody? Oh, so what we're doing is we're, we we got a bunch of uh, questions you can type up in the chat box and uh, try to keep them to uh, strategy related. Um, you know, we've done enough technology and stuff, so go ahead and uh, type up your uh, questions in the chat box. I mean, Aaron, I want to ask though. I mean, in your case with back testing, uh, do you do it with on tick data, for example? That's one. Mm -hmm. So. Are you doing like a full back test debt, let's say six months, or how long will be your typical periods? Well, uh, with with tech data, uh, you know, it's I am presently, you know, actually, uh, you know, I have uh, not dealt with tech data a lot until uh, in the last few months. So I just uh, purchased one year of tech data. It's uh, uh, as a as a start, so uh, you know I certainly wanted to practice uh, you know at least uh, three years, um, you know that's that's but I have to pay for them first. So I only pay for one year. So hopefully I will uh, you know get two more years when one and of these. And these are full order book, full order book that data or just first level. It's so up to uh, ten levels each side. Okay. And I mean, are you referring to another parameter to strategies with parameters or parameterless strategies? Uh, they do have some parameters. Uh, well, the strategies that I have so far uh, developed, uh, but um, uh, you know, 
very simple parameters like look back um, and uh, uh, you know entry threshold that sort of things. Cool. Okay, so uh, anybody got any questions that just joined us? Uh, we, we we're going to keep them in the chat box. So uh, just type away, and uh, that's what we're here for. So if you got any questions, trainingly we have ten people right now. I know uh, Alan's online. Uh, we just uh, I know uh, Adam Bart. Bart, if you have another question, Cruz, I know we have. Vitality. Ah. Uh, no, actually, um, I actually have not used optimization algorithms, uh, whether it's in uh, uh, back test or in uh, real time. Uh, I typically find, uh, you know, uh, a region of parameters where the performance is not very sensitive to small changes in the parameters, so it doesn't really uh, pay very uh, much uh, in terms of um, adopting any uh, optimization algorithm, and I, I frankly don't believe in uh, precise optimization because uh, you know I, I I don't believe that uh, whatever is optimized in the past is necessarily optimal uh, in the future. You know, at some ballpark within some you know region, if it, if the dependence on parameters is not sensitive then that's most important. You know, if it's sensitive, then I, I think all bets are off. Uh, so, no, I do not optimize uh, uh, in any precise way. I mean, in my case, I have experienced the magician firsthand because I had to write, like, the whole optimization engine for the previous company I was working for. And I've seen many people, like, speaking about optimization online, just, you know, out of fun, just with some nice forums. Just, and you do see people trying to optimize, for example, on minimum bar data and disregard and like the spread of the bar, disregard and stop losses. Uh, and the only way to do it actually, I mean, you can't end up with strategies which are like very stable, but it's a very tedious process. And right now, there is no single program that does it because you will have first optimize on some second bar, minimum bar data, and then you have on top of the stress test even more on thick data to see exactly where the strategy will break just because it makes the filters. So it's not a single process whatsoever and this is from my view why most strategies that have been developed with pure optimization will fail. The chances that will survive are minimal. Mm -hmm. any, anybody else got any questions please type away in the chat box. Unless one one thing, because I mean, unless what Alan Alan Honig refers to with regards to optimization algorithms real time is something like uh, let's say a recursive with squares, which it is an optimization on the mm -hmm. actual mm -hmm. squares technique. I mean, I have used this kind of things, and that's a quite viable method to have something working. But again, there you need to have already an established model, so. And usually it will be a linear model. If it's a non-linear, you have to use some real-time Monte Carlo, some fast way of getting your errors correct. So again, it will be, then it comes down to technology. Yes, I think that uh, you know that's a good point. You know, certainly if you uh, regard um, you know the fitting of uh, regression coefficients or uh, some other uh, you know. Uh, Portfolio allocations uh, coefficients using whatever method, you know, either um, quadratic optimization or whatnot. Uh, that uh, I suppose makes sense. You know, that uh, uh, those things, uh, you know, where where you have uh, a very constrained model and you just uh, want to optimize the the weights for uh, each stock in the portfolio. You know, that that makes sense to have a real time optimization. I, yeah, I, mean, I haven't done much of that uh, in my uh, in my own uh, trading, you know, because I, I I do not find that I I don't hold for any longer time. I I trade with a very short duration. So by the time you um, uh, you know optimize it and uh, you're trying to switch your weighting from one setting to another, you know, that is, uh, it's the time that I'm going to exit the portfolio anyway. So yeah, there's no point for me personally to optimize. But for other people who hold for 
you know, several days, maybe it makes sense for them to draw up the PCS. I, I, I think I have here make a correction. I mean, like, if you're doing an RLS method, RLS method, if it has been designed correctly, you can optimize down on a microsecond level. Uh, I can say this thing for a fact because it is a one step optimization. It's almost like it's actually a minimized version of the common filter. So, uh, I mean, if we're going to, uh, you know, any form of RLS uh, on any other ARIMA or ARMA or CARIMA models, that's a one step optimization. So, it wouldn't cost you more than a few microseconds. But again, it depends that you make an assumption on the model. So, um, usually you'll be bound to some linear models. If it's a non linear model on, on RLS, it would take slightly longer, but yet, it will be below a second. Uh, there are right, I'm not, uh, yeah, when I say the, the time it takes, it, it's not really the time it takes to do the computation, but it's the time to change, to actually make the trade, uh, because uh, if you have a large precision, you can't, uh, you know, trade, you know, the entire precision out or in, so it takes some time to evolve from one portfolio uh, waiting to another one, and I'm saying that, well, the this kind of the friction loss in that process is already wiped out my alpha because my, my trading horizon is so short. Uh, you know, on the other hand, if you have a uh, model that hold overnight, then certainly you can do optimization near the close and adjust uh, for, uh, you know, cents and uh, at, at the close orders to adjust the position somewhat every day. So that's why I, you know, just because of my trading horizon, I, I never pay too much attention to that uh, problem. So what kind of holding peers are we talking about? Uh, it ranges from minutes uh, to, uh, you know, an hour. I, I would say the average holding is an hour. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Anybody got any questions? We're just typing them away in the chat box on the right. Um, so if you got questions, uh, type away. I know we've got 16 people online. Just wait around. Is there a chance to Type up your Scott questions. Who's got a question? Anybody? I think like what Bart was saying here, because he's saying about like stress testing, field draw sensitive indicators. Uh, I mean, when I'm saying when I was referring to Monte Carlo, for example, you can use something slightly more clever, like let's say differential evolution, which is as close as possible to a genetic algorithm, but you can actually don't, you can avoid the whole encoding decoding of the parameters. So you're using immediately real numbers. So and it generally it outperforms any other optimization techniques with regards to speed and uh, convergence. So yes, I mean there are some techniques that you can use, but again it depends on what how, how many data you're using, how fast is your backtesting and so uh, just just so um, you guys know, there's a new question that came up from Adam in the chat box. Okay, what database system and programming language uh, do you use in my trading? Well, uh, I uh, differentiate between the backtest process and the, the live trading process. Uh, in when backtesting, I, tip, I typically use uh, actually I only use MATLAB, and um, and once I uh, you know see some promise in the strategy, uh, my partner will call it in uh, C sharp and uh, that that program is both a backtest program as well as a live trading program so I will have my uh, my strategy validated by a completely independent uh, encoding to see if it still works and if so then it can be traded live uh, in that C sharp program uh, we do not use any uh, uh, relational database uh, uh, you know we, we, we simply use uh, text files I, I think there's an agreement here that we're trying to focus less on technology because I've done that enough in my um, in my channel. So um, if you guys just want to keep all the questions focused on strategies, so um, uh, let's let's keep it that. Um, so we've got questions on building strategy. That's what we're here for. You got them. Just type them up. Oh, here we go. What are the worst strategies? What are the what worst, 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 worst strategies? <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, why don't, why, don't you tell, why, don't you tell, why don't you tell people the experience that you guys had with, um, with uh, you, you worked on a strategy for quite a while and then you changed the data set. 
and then you realized um, that it was a bit of a struggle after that? Um, okay. Well, yes. Uh, I was uh, backtesting a, uh, uh, you know, high frequency strategy, and uh, you know that for high frequency strategy, it really depends on your data quality. Uh, and uh, you know, I certainly have been misled by many data sets. Uh, and uh, you know you, you would see great uh, performances out of those uh, data sets and then when you use a better data set you'll find that they disappear but I don't know that that is the uh, sense where you can say it's a worse strategy um, I, I, I actually don't understand what in what sense is a worse strategy <laughs> if a strategy is so bad the one that's not guessed <laughs> I'm sorry the one that that is not guessed Right, right. If it's not, yeah, it's a strategy that is random. That is a rare strategy. If a strategy keeps losing money, that's a good strategy because it's <laughs> fine. I mean, so, I mean, look, I, I, th I think the bad strategy would be, for example, let's say, even though it could make money, it could also be very dangerous. Let's say that suddenly you have some you know, like news event, okay, something about the dollar. And suddenly everything, let's say on a forex pair, both the euro USD or the big USD goes against the dollar. Many people would some on that opportunity to, let's say, put like a long position in both currencies. That would be a big mistake, for example, because suddenly, you know, you, you are exposed, you know, to pretty much dollar positions on the short side, in reality, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, but um, most uh, mean reverting strategy has, uh, has that uh, properties. Uh, that uh, you know it is exposed to a tail risk. I, I think that um, you know if uh, you know, let's say. Uh, no, say but I'm, I'm, but now I'm referring here to momentum strategies, for example. I mean, if there's a garden in the reversion. Well, I mean, for momentum strategy, actually, uh, we expect uh, many uh, losing trades. Uh, on average, there should be there could well be more number of uh, you know losing trades than winning trades um, and however the winning trade are supposed to have a uh, you know much larger return uh, than the, the absolute uh, return of the losing trade um, momentum strategy I don't think that uh, it should have a problem with tail risk because typically uh, you can uh, you, you, you have a sub loss with momentum strategy right so you know if it suddenly start to go against you be able to exit. Now, of course, if you are in a momentum strategy that are multi-day, and uh, especially in, in, let's say, in stock strategy, and you can't exit overnight, that's a problem. So, you know, I typically don't add, uh, uh, trade momentum strategy where I cannot exit the position most of the time, you know, like 23 and a half hours out of 24 hours. Uh, and in that way, I think your tail risk will be very, uh, very limited. Yeah, I think I think also has to do also with how how good uh, trail stop loss you're doing. I mean, there are some brokers and even some prime brokers which may offer you the opportunity of uh, uh, stop loss trail, but usually if you trade directly through an exchange, you will not have this option. So then you have to write your own execution algorithm uh, so that then you can you know attach the order ID of your trade so that you can just automatically amend the order at all times based on some sort of indicator or some signal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's the, probably the best thing that you can do just to have a, a better like uh, risk management in that case. Yes, by stop loss I don't necessarily only refer to those that you can actually place uh, with the broker. Uh, you know, I, I, I I refer to in a more general sense that your algorithm is actually monitoring your P&L or you know the market and and send out orders to neutralize your current position uh, when necessary. So yeah, I mean there can there can be uh, any kind of uh, condition that would. Change. I mean in my case, I'm not used directly to with a broker. I mean my case from direct exchange. So. Uh, my biggest problems were I'm actually like calculate. I mean, reconcile the book. Uh, it is usually jumps and effects, which can be very bad if you have big positions. Mm -hmm. So in, th in that case, you can get burned 
within a few minutes. Okay. Because they are the spikes. You can have a spike of like 30, you know, 20 pips easily. So in that case, you cannot do anything. You'll be cut directly from the stop loss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, let's see. Adam has another question. He said, do you have any specific methodology you go through in creating algorithms? Um, I don't uh, know that there are specific methodology. It's kind of vague, uh, you know, what what uh, methodology means. Because um, you know, I my, my uh, style in creating strategy is trying to actually create as many different type of strategy as possible, you know, so that they don't uh, all fail at the same time. So, uh, in fact, I want to try different methodology with different strategy. I don't want to be using the same methodology every time. So. So I would say that uh, you know there is. I try to avoid a specific methodology. It might be a, a reasonable answer to that. Uh, but uh, if you want to, you know, follow up with this question, you know, feel free to 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 type in more because maybe I do not understand specifically what you mean. Uh, but has another question. Some time ago, we had a presentation about Deltics. Do you find any weakness in backtesting on that platform in comparison to MATLAB? Uh, I must say that I have not backtested on Deltix, so I would not know what weakness it has. Um, however, in general, uh, uh, you know, and like again, I I, uh, I have um, a, a close collaborator in in implementing strategy, and the general conclusion that um, he has reached is that. Uh, uh, it is always most flexible if you start from scratch without anybody's system. Just if you are a C++ programmer, Java programmer, C Sharp programmer, uh, you can do anything you want and that's uh, the most flexible. Okay, and uh, let's see, Adam has uh, another question. So what kind of quant indicators do we use? Uh, what pieces of data? Uh, oh, actually the indicators I use are the most simple. Uh, you know, I use things such as return is the most uh, the, the 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 indicator I use most often. Return, uh, quite simply. And how about uh, any, how about any analysis on big data directly on the order book, for example? Well, uh, you know, I am a fan of looking at the order flow. Um, I have not found a viable strategy using that yet, I have to admit, but uh, you know, certainly um, a lot of people have found that um, order flow uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a good uh, indicator. Okay, let's see what else has uh, is, uh, Adam mm -hmm. asked. What kind of risk analysis uh, do we use on uh, financial instruments? Um, well, in terms of risk analysis, uh, basically you just you know you want to know uh, what are the uh, what are the tail risk uh, if you are holding that uh, instrument, right? So, but you know, in terms of tail risk, you have no really good way to look at it except uh, historically. I mean, how um, you know, and and everybody know that uh, you know the future will always surprise you, so. Uh, you know that's that's the best we could do is to stress test it in history because um, but uh, you know be ex expect that uh, you know the future will be worse than the past that's all, all I could uh, say about that um, now let me see what else uh, I think you have a second part of the questions let me try to scroll back to that question Uh, favorite type of instrument. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. In that case, though, I mean, what are you trying? To, I mean, are you trying to find a generic distribution? Are you targeting? Because obviously, you know, you're trying to get some sort of bar analysis mm -hmm. on the risk side. Yes. So are you trying to? Are you trying to hit a bar? Are you trying to hit some gamble distribution? Are you? I mean, because if you're, if you're trying to see the fat tails, obviously you're going to see anything not normal. So in that case, what kind of analysis are you doing? Well, I, I frankly don't think that uh, you know you you can do too much analysis on it because um, uh, when 
uh, I think Nassim Taleb had a good point in his uh, latest book, which is that uh, you know when you are at the tail end, the events are so infrequent that uh, you know you could basically fit any distribution you like through it. There's not enough data to to constrain your model, um, and uh, so basically you want to see that if you know, for example, if you're trading a um, equities uh, directional future strategy. Uh, you want to look back to see that for that particular future, uh, you know, for a particular time frame, what's the worst drawdown in history that you could uh, have? You know, let's say this equity index future, you know, could be a 22% drawdown in uh, a matter of uh, one day, right? Uh, maybe intraday is even worse. Who knows? Uh, I don't remember. But actually, overnight is 22%. So if you are trading a equity index future strategy, you know. Be prepared that uh, one day you will reach at least that uh, kind of drawdown. I, mean, uh, I, I know, I know, I know this approach from Dalek, but at the same time, he disregards though because you know, obviously, when, for example, you are seeing like the rate of return, let's say between minutes, on let's say six, let's say one year worth of minibar data, the fatals which you will see on a very high spread between you know on a minute. Will be very very small. It will be like you know, it will be squashed by the majority of the normal distribution. But in reality, these patterns happen guaranteed twice a day every week. So, but yet, statistically speaking, you wouldn't regard them. But in reality, that will be the winning part of your portfolio. So, this is the typical academic approach, which is regards that actually the quality of approach is more, is more important. Uh, actually. I I missed the, your the main point of the argument. So, are, are you arguing? I mean, I think, that, I think the point is that because you know people will say that suddenly you have a normal distribution, and of course you know you can fit anything you want because the patterns are so small. But in reality, these patterns they, they, they may seem small in comparison to the majority of your distribution. But if in reality this could just happen twice a day every day, but of course in comparison to the rest of the data, they seem nothing. They can still be the major part of your winning portfolio. Because yes. you can take very small positions, very fast, be in and out, and actually have a very almost zero risk management. Yes, that is um, well certainly. I mean, that's certainly the, the, the argument in favor of higher frequency trading, uh, and I, I I do agree with that approach because uh, not only uh, if you're holding a short duration, not only uh, do you reduce your exposure and uh, your possibility of have, uh, suffering this drastic drawdown in this such a short duration. But you have a um, you accumulate enough profit to offset that possible tail risk. So you know you know if it's uh, uh, in in a relative time scale, if you are doing high frequency trading, uh, and uh, you know the the occurrence, the probability of a, a fat tail event is 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 like that is you know it's like one in a million years. Uh, in the context of a daily holding period, so you know people say, "Oh, you know, I, my strategy, uh, it's uh, uh, will 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 never suffer a more than 10% drawdown in a, in a uh, in 10,000 years." But if you are high in frequency trading, uh, that can be extended to, relatively speaking, once in one million years, because actually you have so many trades occurring one day that you have already earned enough profit in in in. In the normal course of trading, to offset that once in a lifetime, uh, uh, you know, six sigma event. So that uh, that's you know certainly an argument for high frequency trading. Um, okay, so let let's move on to the next question. Uh, favorite type of instrument? Uh, I I uh, well I, I trade uh, spot forex futures stocks and. Um, and I'm getting into options, uh, you know, well, testing some options strategy myself. So, uh, practically anything. Uh, curve fitting leads to overfitting. Yeah, I mean, curve fitting is the same as overfitting. It's synonymous in my mind. Uh, linear regression analysis is preferred. Yes, that's right. I, uh, I, I am uh, in favor of linear regression because of the. Uh, uh, because it's the simplest kind of model, and uh, uh, you will find many econometricians use linear methods as well. And that's simply because there are all kinds of nonlinear methods. When when you give up on linear methods, there are 
so many kind of nonlinear method that it is, uh, you know, really in increase the possibility of uh, overfitting. Do you have anything on option trading? No, uh, I have not. Uh, uh, I didn't talk, talk about uh, option trading in the new book. Um, that would have to wait for uh, the next one, I suppose. Time horizon. Um, yeah, the time horizon of the most profitable trades typically is under half an hour. Uh, you know, from a few minutes to half an hour. In what jurisdiction am I based? Uh, yes, I, I am in Ontario, Canada. My fund, however, uh, is uh, is domiciled in the U.S. Uh, I don't currently have a, tr a live trading model that uses common filter. To be quite honest, I talk about that in my book, and I experimented with it, but. Um, I have not uh, find it necessary in any of my uh, live trading model uh, as of yet. Now that that might change. Uh, you know, every day I try to incorporate new techniques uh, in in models. So uh, I I certainly know more techniques that I deployed. David asked, "What is the experience with pairs that do not pass the physical test, but um, back test show good PNL?" Um, there are many pairs that are like that, and they can be very good for intraday trading. So, uh, if if you are, um, you know, a lot of pairs uh, you, you can show short-term mean reversion, and yet uh, they completely uh, fall apart overnight. So those you will not be able to uh, find co-integration with them. But that doesn't mean that you can't trade them intraday. Actually, it's the thing that we had discussed before we started officially on the meeting with, um, with Ernie. I mean, there is actually this technique, just now that there are more people, of self-organizing maps. And actually, there's even one book which is called Self-Organizing Maps in Finance by Springer Editions. Uh, and there are ways that you can actually detect when something goes to a point that it behaves like in a mean reversion. Um, and you actually detect it, it's fairly fast. So there are ways, I mean, you can actually, and usually these pairs, because I have experience in the first hand, that do not pass when you go to this, they will always pass some sort of test via self-organized maps. Mm -hmm. And uh, not getting in 100% so far, so. Actually, actually, in our case, we had even the case of uh, where we do the back test. Sometimes the back test at one point wouldn't perform that well. We will do the Cohona maps. For that period, and we see actually that at that point in time, uh, there was no relation between the two instruments. So we knew that we had the component maps as part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Always do check if something. Tell me. Do you have the uh, reference of that book? Maybe you could type it on the chat. Yes, of course. So Just give me a second. Actually, I will get it. I will get the link from Amazon. And you will see it yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just bear with me. Okay. Um, in the meantime, let me look for the yeah, other uh, here. questions here. David's got one. Uh, okay. Five, yeah. six questions. Scroll, scroll back. What is, uh, when I'm talking about, okay, Clay said, when I'm talking about high frequency trading, what time frame? Um, well, for me, I, I have not started time frequency trading, or actually I haven't implemented any live strategy. I have. Um, paper traded it and back back tested them. Uh, in terms of the highest frequency strategy I'm doing right now, the holding period uh, could be as short as uh, you know 30 seconds, uh, some uh, or one minute. I, I have uh, I have seen that kind of trade before, but um, in terms of like the average is one hour for that strategy. Uh, but in terms of um, testing. Uh, both in back test and in uh, walk forward testing, I have certainly tested strategy that holds for, um, um, on average, a matter of uh, 30 seconds. And that strategy is uh, successful on paper, but not successful in life because of the, uh, uh, the you know, the slippage issues. But then are you executing via market orders or limit orders? So. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me. Uh, yeah, that is a. Uh, let me. Uh,
put that on my uh, wish list. It's actually it's certainly a very good book. It's certainly a very good book. And actually, as I technique, is I find it be a very good one. There can, you can, I mean, and the solution actually is, is, is I mean, the explicit solution is not very difficult to to prove it yourself. So in my case, I actually have done some small variations on the explicit form. Oh, okay, okay. That uh, uh, ah ah ah. I see. Okay, let me let me um. Save that. Uh, the, the and I guess also one very good thing in comparison to going to aggression techniques, uh, at least self-organized maps have the advantage that you can map. Okay, okay, let's say that you want to compare ten instruments all against each other. What you can do is actually then create a two-dimensional map. Uh, assigning to each instrument an X and Y dimension, and then actually you can see them like they move in like in a little like map, literally, and see the ones that they are moving together, they will be in the same cluster. So then immediately these ones, they are actually going to create it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I will have to read that book to uh, to get a better understanding. Uh, Mike said, uh, my p &L for the past 30 periods, I, I actually don't know what a period uh, going to be, but um, uh, I could tell you that I was just sending a uh, uh, performance uh, report to a prospective investor, so that was, um, uh, I could tell you that, uh, that for that particular strategy, the sharp ratio is about 3.5, uh, with an unlevered return of 15%, uh, and that uh, was starting in <clears throat> that was live traded since uh, 2012 uh, May. So I don't know that this uh, whether you know I, I don't exactly know what you mean by period. So uh, I, I I just tell you that that when that strategy got uh, started uh, and in terms of maximum drawdown, it's about um, uh, I can't remember the exact number. I think it's uh, it's certainly under four percent. They are ways. So you're saying that on short time frames they should pass tests over certain intervals. Uh, that one thing that it was uh, David Turk that asked. Yeah, it is a part of neural networks. I mean, they were discovered by Kohona, who is a famous, if I'm ever a professor. Um, they are. They are like associative maps in reality. Uh, they are the B associative maps and Kohon maps. They are quite similar. Uh, Kohon is slightly more clever. Mm -hmm. uh, the only trick, though, that you uh, that some people can have is the most typical, um, let's say, source code that some people can find online. It has to do that you compare. It has to do with the distances that you compare circular distances or perpendicular or Manhattan. So there, there's not so many options. I mean, in my case, I wrote my own framework for that. But it's not really a difficult algorithm to to implement. It's certainly much easier than typical back propagation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, David asks if there are any uh, specific algorithm or methods to clean up noise. I had tried um, using uh, wavelets uh, with some degree of success, uh, but uh, that whole strategy didn't work. But you know that may not be the uh, problem with wavelets. So you, you might give that uh, give that a try. Certainly, uh, MATLAB has a uh, toolbox that uh, has wavelets uh, algorithms in it. Uh, Complex event processing system. Um, well, I myself have not used uh, any of these uh, complex event processing because um, I don't generate. Uh, you know, I, my my strategies are are not complex, so it it doesn't have the, uh, the, 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 the these complicated indicators that require uh, uh, that would make that would be make more efficient by CEP. So um, I, you know, so I can't really say that I'm I'm clamoring for that kind of system, but I don't know if uh, other people have different experiences. 
uh, in my case, actually, my system is a pure CP, uh, CP system, uh, but I design myself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I mean, I can really, I, I know that some people love Streambase. Uh, my problem with most CP engines is, is that the fact that the moment that you activate it, uh, it starts working from that point forward. You cannot suddenly start requesting past events or you will have to start from a past event and then just roll the whole window forward, which can be a quite slow process, especially if you're going through the data, let's say like a time window, rolling time window of let's say five minutes of ticks. That can be slow. So this is why I had to design everything from scratch. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just depends like you know, I mean, how, you know, what works for each person. I mean, at least with my engine, it supports both the classical strategies and like CP events. It depends how you want to do it. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, people who are using CEP in a very, uh, I guess, uh, uh, simplistic way, which is just to say that you react to a event or react to a text so that the, the, the trading signal are not generated uh, every bar, but it's generated in response to an uh, event such as a tick arrival or a news event arrival. So in that sense, of course, uh, you know, a lot of the Practically all the, our algorithms are uh, CEP based because uh, we react to tech rather than having to check whether we should send our signal at the end of an uh, arbitrary bar. I, I think I guess because he was referring to stream base, uh, I guess he was referring much more to uh, having a proper rolling window of holding data uh, and not just uh, not just you know uh, you know going like you know checking for an event. That's that's too generic. Mm -hmm. I guess the only problem for that thing it has to do with that with how well uh, you persist your data in memory, because obviously now you know if let's say you have let's say ten uh, rolling time windows of tick data, and let's say it, it, each window is five minutes, depending on on the type of process. If you're doing forex, this can be quite a lot of ticks. And that can be made just on one strategy. It can be quite complicated. So unless you have like the right in-memory system, it can lead to many problems. Okay, David has a question. What is your experience with trading futures uh, versus equities? Um, trading equities, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's quite tough in the uh, in the current market environment. Uh, unless you are um, just, uh, you know, trading at a close, for example. Uh, if you're tra intraday trading equities, uh, there is a, a, a great deal of uh, high frequency trading gaming going on. There's a lot of routing issues that you have to navigate, um, you know, to, to basically earn a few ticks. Uh, otherwise, you'll be disadvantaged by your broker, disadvantaged by the dark pool, disadvantaged by the ivory the trader. There are innumerable players uh, that can disadvantage you in the equity space. Now, in the future space, of course, there is also ivory trading, but at least we have a, uh, you know, a consolidated quote. So you don't have routing issue. Uh, you don't have uh, dark pool um, gaming issues. So um, that's uh, so. I find that actually trading futures is easier uh, if you just have a strategy and you back test it and it works most likely it's going to work uh, in live trading in future right? you know, barring the issue of regime change and barring the issue of overfitting and so forth but in equities you know it's pretty tough to back test an intraday uh, trading strategy and even if it works in your back test even if you have tech data to show that it works in intraday when you trade it live there's so many routing issues involved that might render it unprofitable unless your offer is so high that nobody can game it away. Um, uh, sorry, I mean, there was actually one question before I forgot to actually give an answer with regards to filtering deep data. Uh, I'm not really sure if you could classify it as filtering, but there's a couple of algorithms that can uh, help you to reduce the number of deep data, yet retaining the safe of the actual uh, chart. I mean, the one I'll go is called the Douglas Becker line simplification, where pretty much it is not an, in, an interpolation technique. It's just it's just a clever way of just reducing the data, just still keeping the majority of the things that 
give you the chart as it is. So it's actually both a way of filtering tick data and also a way to reduce the number of tick data for at least a more decent time for backtesting. I think, I mean, there is this technique, there's a couple of other ones. Again, they all have to do down to the area of, I mean, line simplification. And most of these algos, usually you'll find them on uh, GIS papers, like for simplifying and like the lines of maps. But the same technique can actually be used for uh, tick data. Mm -hmm. you, do you want to uh, uh, type in the name of that technique in the chat window, uh, London? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean it, it is quite, I mean, quite famous um, uh, algo. Where is it? Here it is. Um, there are some variations of it. Uh, that's one. Douglas, Douglas Baker is actually the most simple one. I would ah, say. okay. Very great. Uh, because you know you can you can. Max, I was speaking with Brian about it like some one week ago. I was actually about to tell him then we didn't have the time. The time I didn't have the time to tell him the name. Uh, because you can end up, uh, you can manage to simplify. Um, let's say a tick data series. Let's say from let's say typical year USD, which can be about half a million ticks a day down to like 50% of that. So that can be quite significant. Great. Thank you. So let's see what are the uh, next question here. Uh, there was actually one also from Bart uh, that he was referring to the price suction for testing and trading. Uh, there is one thing that I'm not really sure that many people know about it. It depends also where you trade. Uh, if you trade in the States, every, every exchange has different rules and regulations with regards to what is the price option at the opening and the closing of, of, of exchange. Uh, and there are many cases actually where you, you won't even observe that price whatsoever. You just, you'll just see the jump when you open your platform. Uh, also, there are the cases that, um, for example, with the price close with active with option price of the close, there's the case that sometimes in some exchanges they will allow on to be let's say a maximum deviation from the VWAP of the day. So many I have seen many strategies falling down just simply because of people that didn't know the regulations of these exchanges. So I think it's quite important to find the papers and just decide where you're going to trade and just to know exactly what how the exchange decides what is the closing price. Yes. Uh, well, let's uh, answering to answer Bart's question about volume. Um, I think uh, signed volume is of value. Volume itself, I have not found it to be of much value. Uh, signed volume uh, is all the flow. So you have to um, be able to determine actually the direction of the trade, whether the aggressor uh, is a buyer or a seller. Then you can put a sign to the volume and that's what people call order flow. Uh, with regards to Alex, I'm, Alex I'm sorry mate, um, I'm already partnering the firm so I'm not selling the system. <laughs> Alan asks, do you use academic papers? Yes, I, uh, I read academic papers from time to time and to get inspirations and some papers are you know complete strategy that was exposed and others are uh, simply uh, inspiration for particular techniques but I certainly uh, use them as sources. Uh, are you able to successfully use options in your automated quantity trading? Actually um, uh, that's uh, I, I'm uh, back testing uh, some automated trading uh, option strategies. Uh, the liquidity is only an issue if you're trading stock options. It's uh, not a big issue if you're trading options on futures uh, and uh, yeah, index options, for example. So uh, it's not uh, a, a problem. I think also, though, but there's also the, the problem of, of the news. Uh, corporate events can can get a strategy really to lose all this money. So even though I like I like the idea of having something completely fully automated, uh, still I would never allow it to execute by itself. OK. 
Okay, so let's see, David has a question to, for trades that last 30 to 60 minutes. Okay, short term mean reversion, okay. Uh, yeah, if you expect it to uh, mean revert in 30 to 60 minutes, I think the longest bar you should use is one minute, but uh, hopefully you can have one second bar data that would make your back test much more accurate. I agree. What is your opinion of using the take rule to detect buy sell pressure? Okay, uh, I I have tried both, um, and um, you know the the V pin, and you know basically using the um, determining order flow. Uh, you know the 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 results, at least in back tests, are very similar, whether you use tech or you use the uh, uh, volume bar. Um, and, uh, but because volume bar is so much easier to deal with, you know, I guess that's an argument for using it. How crowded is the trading space for pair trading in futures and forex? Actually, I don't know that um, uh, pair trading in forex is particularly crowded, but uh, pair trading in futures, depending what you mean by pair trading, if you're talking about calendar spreads, certainly it's a lot of people trading calendar spreads. With regard to uh, ACNs, uh, LMAX so far, at least with regards to Europe and Asia, is the best, in my opinion. Um, because all the orders that you see there are all limit orders. There's no flash orders whatsoever. And they do have a very good liquidity. Um, now, the next thing I would go, I mean, hotspot would be the other option. Uh, not cure next necessarily, or even Rogers. Rogers has an amazing liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that uh, when you pick the ECN, just beware that, uh, you know, which one has last look and which one doesn't. So, um, you know, for example, Hotspot has uh, around a 200 millisecond last look for the market maker. So, uh, you send a market order um, and thinking that, uh, you know, the, the, the order book is, uh, you know, the best bid us is such and such, and you send a bit market order and all of a sudden it will execute at the worst price because the market maker can pull that uh, bid or ask <coughs> within 20, 200 milliseconds of you sending a market order. So, um, and that, you know, is true from various other uh, ECN too, but some ECN, uh, you know, advertise them as being no last look liquidities. Is that uh, true for L LMAX? LMAX is true, yeah. For LMAX is true, yeah. So no last look for LMAX. Okay, nope. that's... No, no. That's everything great. that you see is everything that you get. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, I guess I, you know, it also depends on the volumes. I mean, there are people that, you know, they're speaking about ECNs or different brokers. It depends how much you're, how much money you're putting per trade. So are you, are you, you know, like if someone is, is you know, in the region of, well, let's say, 1,500, Lots plus per trade, uh, and even more. Then even if you go on a hotspot, it wouldn't be a big issue because one way or another you would pay some uh, good commission, or you would end up paying the commission through your slippers. I mean, this is expected always, um, unless again, unless you are doing your manual execution, like mm -hmm. proper executing algorithms. So, but but you know, then there are different complications, different different problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question about can the spread. Can it be traded over short term? Surely it can be traded over short term if you can find the right strategy. I mean, it's very liquid, the uh, certain can the spreads, yes. Uh, with regards to the dark pool trades, just be very careful. Dark pools sometimes are not as good as people think. Um, it just, you know, you have to see really um, how much volume you can get for a very good price. 
and also there's many cases uh, where the dark pools will serve better other clients than the ones with the, with the smaller volumes because the, I mean, the rules with regards to who trades first are not very clear sometimes. Right, uh, but David is uh, asking about live data. I, I, um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by uh, live data into dark pool trades because dark pool, uh, once a trade occurred, they have to post it to the consolidated tape. So once it's in the consolidated tape, anybody can get it, right? So um, uh, I don't know in what sense are you saying that only Nanex uh, offer live data into dark pool trades. Because, yeah, I mean, by, by law, all trades have to be posted uh, to the tape, no matter whether it occurred in a dark pool or whether it's occurred in the ECN due to a uh, hidden order uh, or not. What is your opinion of option selling? Um, well, it's risky. <laughs> 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 I don't touch them. Yeah. Twenty-five people with only three people. Oh, okay. Yeah. So see that. Hi guys, you uh, got gals. There's gonna be more questions out there. Oh, here we go. Uh, David said the worst trade uh, was uh, to use a stop limit order uh, uh, during a major news release and then adding to a losing position after the stop has, go, has not gone off. Yes, that's a, a very important point. Um, okay, uh, our f greatest learning experience. What, my greatest learning experience is overconfidence. Uh, I had a, uh, a Forex strategy uh, that I started trading in the late uh, 2010. Uh, which uh, practically had uh, no losing days for you know three months. Um, so uh, we leveraged it, uh, you know, to the max, uh, basically, 14 times. Uh, and then it came uh, August 2011 when the, suddenly the uh, we had this uh, uh, U.S. federal debt downgrade, and the market suddenly went berserk um, over the weekend. You know, on, on the Sunday night, and uh, so you know we had a massive drawdown as a, as a result. So that's the, my biggest learning experience: is not to get overconfident just because you had a great one. I guess in my case, I will just say that do not rely on your stop loss. Stop loss doesn't mean a thing because mm -hmm. you can have a jump, and it can it may jump your stop loss price, or you may end up uh, not being able to completely get rid of your assets that you want to get rid of through a stop loss. So just have many measures uh, to avoid such kind of cases because they are common actually. Depending again the size of the position but they can be quite common. Yes. Um, David said that the uh, consolidated tape is lack. Yes, certainly consolidated tape is um, is not as uh, you know maybe uh, 15 to 20 millisecond uh, delayed relative to direct feed. Now, I have not subscribed to any direct feed from a dark pool um, myself. Um, my understanding is that, for example, if you are a customer of Lime Trading and you are co-located at the Lime um, uh, data center, uh, they have subscribed to the direct feeds of some of the major exchanges. Now, I do not know if they have also subscribed to the direct feed from the dark pools or whether even such things exist, that uh, even if the direct if the dark pool provide direct feed. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, uh, I'm not absolutely certain about it, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's not difficult. If you have enough money, I'm sure that uh, you can subscribe to some of the direct feed. Um, now, when you're saying feeling breath uh, alive on dark pool, uh, I don't know that uh, you know Nanex can uh, provide you because the the most uh, the lowest latency feed is always the direct feed from the market. So Nanex is not the market. Nanex is also just a data provider. So you have to route to data, Nanex data center before it routes to you. So it's not going to be as fast as if it's directly have a connection to the 
stock pool itself. And um, my my bet is that uh, you should talk to a broker that um, make it cost effective uh, for you to subscribe to this kind of directory when you are co-located at their data center. John uh, says, what do you think about trading non-exchange traded products? Uh, I have no experience trading OTC product. Maybe London Quan has some uh, comments on that. No, I have my previous um, job, but um, I guess I mean with bonds is not really an issue. Um, especially in last year, the whole market of bonds has exploded, so it's not really uh, a problem. It has to do really with uh, how much experience you have, because this is a completely different universe itself. Uh, equities and FX is something that is much more normal. Uh, bonds, it's a completely different base to master. And I mean, this is why at least most people that I know that are working in Panos, they will always concentrate on one product and even for that product with like a few specific instruments. Not, uh, not the whole class of forex and equities and many other things. Just, just only one, and a very few again, symbols. Not many. Mm -hmm. uh, Clay asked uh, if we have any uh, suggestion how to deal with uh, news events. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I used to uh, try to. Uh, well, first of all, there are predictable news events such as. Uh, the 8.30 release of macroeconomic data. So if you have a strategy that uh, might go uh, a wire because of that, so you should exit your position before that happens. So that's one way to uh, avoid uh, news events. But of course, there are unexpected new events. My, my um, uh, principle is that uh, if my position gets hit by an unexpected news event that is likely to have significant, you know, momentum, you just have to exit it, even if there's a, uh, you know, have to take a loss. Well, in my case, I'm doing quite a lot of tick analysis on, on the order book. So um, I'm taking um, a number of my own uh, indicators, if you can call them indicators, uh, just to see how much suppression there is on the order book, because usually before any any major news event, the tick frequency will go sky high. And that's usually one of the first indicators that, that you can expect that something is going to happen. That's the one thing. Uh, the other thing, at least in my case, I do subscribe to Spock, which is like the this live um, audio feed of guys that's pretty much like speaking to you in news all the time. Um, it's roughly about like 300 pounds a month and it does pay off. At least it keeps you uh, quite, quite ready. And with regards, I mean, at least again, with my strategies, I do have a number of, of switch regimes where you know, you would switch from, uh, let's say, different behavior, you have like more ticks, less behavior, you have like like a different number of ticks, so it depends. Mm -hmm. I, generally, I certainly believe in like switch regimes because the strategy becomes more dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh there's a question of uh, a brokerage company for AT. Uh, what exactly uh, does AT stands for? Automatic trading. Oh, automatic trading. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I use interactive brokers. I use the Lime. Um, and uh, I use uh, uh, well, I used to use Ready Plus, but uh, I actually don't, don't recommend it as you know for automatic trading. Um, but uh, you know, of course, uh, for line trading, you know, the account has to be probably at least one million. Um, so you know, if you have a smaller account than that, certainly Interact Broker is. Uh, uh, as good as any, but if you are, for example, if you are a futures trader, uh, there are better ones than uh, IB. There are, for example, Myris Futures, I've heard, is a good one. Uh, Lightspeed is a good one. 
uh, and uh, if you are interested just in forex it, it, and you have a sufficient account uh, size account size it's better to get a prime brokerage to sponsor you accessing the ECN directly yeah I mean my kids don't deal with the broker so <laughs> yeah Sandra uh, so you just avoid selling options um, well, there are, uh, of course, ways to uh, deal with uh, the risk in options, uh, 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 you know, short options. Um, you know, you can have a sub loss. I mean, short options is not that diff uh, different from having, a, you know, any uh, position, uh, unhedged position in, in, uh, in stock or in future. You know, you still have a, you know, if you're long, future you have a risk of uh, suddenly uh, getting hit by an event too but the options has the double risk of being uh, you know uh, ha have the volatility in, in, you know exploding on you not only because the price drop but the volatility also exploded on you so it's uh, doubly dangerous but uh, you can still exit them you know you know before that happened of course by the time you exit them it may be too late so um, but uh, you know it, the risk is perhaps double that of holding just a, a future but you know if your position is small enough that's that should be okay uh, yes I, I I actually have tried a variation of a strategy that I used to run buying stock instead of buying the stock I buy options but um, uh, I find that that unfortunately was a stock option, so the bid ask spread is too wide, so that wasn't very good. Uh, but if you are uh, trading futures, in, 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 in trading futures and trading options on futures, they have a pretty similar um, liquidity and have, you know, for, for, for example, for energy futures or for stock index future. The liquidity on the options on futures is this pretty much the same as the liquidity on the future itself so you know you can take your pick as to whether you trade the futures or you trade the options how do you get tech data for options uh, there are a number of uh, tech data provider that are for options there is the techdata.com there's nanex and there is also uh, cqgdatafactory.com well, it's also Reuters, but it's rather expensive. Yes, Reuters uh, certainly expensive. Um, I'm sure that you can, uh, you know, there are many more expensive vendors, but the, these are the three that I know is, uh, you know, reasonable price. Clay asked the minimum sharp ratio. I would say one is the absolute absolute minimum I try to get it 1.5 at least but of course if your strategy is one among many you can tolerate a lower sharp ratio like one because uh, if it has no correlation with your other strategy then the addition of this strategy will uh, increase this overall sharp ratio of your portfolio Yes, I, I, I try to set a maximum drawdown, um, even if sharp ratio is big. Uh, and the way I maintain the maximum drawdown is using this thing called the constant proportion portfolio insurance. Sentiment can be useful. Uh, I have not back tested it myself, but if you look at Ravenpack's research, uh, it looks great. I mean, they had on paper at least it looks uh, excellent so you look you can read up some of their research uh, posted by uh, raven pack uh, when you trade equities what's the loss you're willing to take pennies or dollar percent yeah i i measure that in percent uh, i don't uh, have a stop loss necessary for individual stocks uh, I have a stop loss for um, the whole portfolio, but uh, not for individual stock. But actually, for a long short portfolio, I don't even have a stop loss um, because uh, it's the tail risk is much lower. In my case, I'm just dealing only with direct amounts with regards to the base 
quarter currency. Uh, so for every position, I will, I will say that let's say it will be like a you know, 40 or 50,000 worst case scenario position. But as uh, if I have a uh, uh, backtest strategy with level two data, uh, no, I haven't done that uh, so far. I've done it, and it's not a nice thing. <laughs> uh, quite time consuming, and the only reason that why someone would use level two data is only to to use some, let's say, virtual eternal execution to simulate how possibly your trade would execute. Um, sometimes I just think that that is kind of like useless. You can always do a normal like level, you know, like a first level of the order book uh, backtesting and then just just take a penalty factor. So let's say that for every position you will deduct let's say like two or three pips for in and out. So let's say six all together. Mm -hmm. So um Assumptions for bid ask spread. I think the best way to do it is you don't assume it, and you just use uh, bid ask data to backtest the strategy. Because bid ask spread has a way of giving you surprises. When there's a market stress, they widen. So um, just knowing the average bid ask spread doesn't uh, really help you have a very accurate backtest. And then uh, also you should uh, always make sure that uh, the the depth of the order book uh, or the, the the liquidity at the top of book is sufficient for your order size. So otherwise, you have um, a finite layer of the order book taken out by your order, and that would uh, be tough to estimate. Well, again, but uh, it depends, you know, because let's say if you submit an uh, an iceberg order or just even a limit order, uh, you know, you're not really affected like by the effects of the market order whatsoever. Uh, I, I guess. A very serious thing that some people do not regard is to do their calculation of how much, let's say, their ask has to, to be, assuming that you enter this with an X bid plus your transactions cost. Uh, you know, you can actually, they are, they are, it's actually quite easy to come up with an explicit form, formula that you know, you'll know that the moment that you enter in a position, for example, at least in effects, you need to. Um, you need to have like uh, an increase on the price by I think it was like 0 0.00005, assuming nothing like it was like $25 in a million transaction cost on the base currency. So I think you, you certainly have to get from your broker all your details and just integrate uh, a live PNL calculation within the strategy, at least to you know at which point you will start putting your stop loss because you don't want to do it either too early or too late. Ideally, the moment that you have crossed you know, the, the positive sign, just maybe like plus two, three pips, then you just drop your stop loss inside. Okay, so the um, Mark asks about tech data. Yes, I, I mentioned the three uh, vendor, techdata.com, nanx.com, CQG data factory. Johansson tests. How do you? Uh, how much to lag the model? I, I think uh, typically you just lag it one uh, period. Uh, I I don't see that you need to lag it too many period. I I never find it to be beneficial. Uh, yes, uh, David, you are right. Uh, cheapest data is from CQG, but uh, I uh, am not sure about the data quality. I I actually have a problem. Um, what market data vendor do you use? Um, well, right now I'm just using the uh, feed from interactive brokers. But if you want to get uh, lower latency data, you can get it from IQT. Um, what, what what was that? Uh, I forgot the name. IQ Tech. Uh, maybe uh, IQ Brian. IQ Feed. IQ feed, yes, yeah, that's correct. That's what I use. IQ feed. Yes. Yes, that's right. So Yes, I Ravenpack certainly is expensive, David. Uh, I, I I do agree. Yep. 
yeah, well, you know, if they, if the, um, if there's, uh, if trading strategy based on sentiment is as profitable as their backtest claim, then uh, you know it's uh, worth it. But uh, you never know until you get their uh, backtest data. It's. Um, Uh, I understand your platform is written in C sharp. It's lack of Linux support. Well, some people, I, I, I you know, I, I in, at the frequency that I'm trading, I don't see uh, a big difference between Linux and uh, Windows uh, server. So uh, maybe for high frequency traders, they want to um, that matters to them. But I'm not a high frequency trader. What about you, Mr. Lennon Kwan? No. I mean, like, you know me really well. I'm a fan of Linux, but yeah. it depends how you want to use it. Simple as that. Uh, if it's just to have a, a platform and you're not doing like ultra high frequency, it's pointless. Um, I mean, for me, it's just purely for just I like Linux just to to run some models of mine. Um, simply because it's, I do like CUDA. I do use CUDA, and I just recently bought an Intel. Uh, Xeon Phi, and they just have better support actually on Linux. Uh, what do you guys want to do for time? It's coming up to seven o'clock or one hour. You want to take a couple more questions, or you want to keep going? Uh, well, I do have to go uh, okay. in uh, very shortly, but let me take one last question. Okay, Mark Mark's already posted it. Yeah. Um, I have tried to use the Hearst exponent to determine the regime uh, or spreads on crude oil futures. Uh, I agree with you, Mark. Uh, Hearst exponent apparently requires a lot of data to work. Uh, and um, uh, you know, with the amount of data that I use, uh, it's uh, not good enough, long, long enough. So I sympathize with you. I had the same experience. I think Rich has got a comment. Oh, what with the with the Haskell? Yeah, Haskell is a nice language. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I guess. What you want to take one more question? Oh, well, I guess now if any people want to ask, and okay. I think maybe on the technical side, if if anyone wants to leave, you know, I can stay for a little bit more. Oh. I guess not. Oh, here here comes a. Question from John and David. Not purely direct exchange data feeds, and again, all the, all the all the big data are just being saved like uh, live. I don't have to, I would say, download anything. Just like, reconcile all my big data. It's free, so in a way. Uh, Dave's got another comment about uh, learning modeling. I, I do like nonlinear uh, uh, learning models, but I'm much more down the path of uh, evolutionary programming. I think like Eric, uh, Brian has seen some of my work. Um, I think like there are people that like to keep their statistics and their you know and have a model and try to test it. Um, I don't trust, even though I do come from a math background. I don't trust most mathematical models. So I found out that actually I can generate many models through. Uh, evolution programming from scratch. Uh, and most of them actually do perform much better than the statistical model. So I think actually when I'm, when I'm referring to evolution programming, I mean, um, let's say, genetic programming, multi-expression programming, like Cartesian evolution programming, anything down that path. Yeah. If you, want to ask, if you want to ask anything about MATLAB, ask Brian, not me. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Well, well, I guess, Ernie, you want to take this last one question for the uh, MATLAB Simulink Neural Network Toolbox? Well, I, I have not used a Neural Network Toolbox. I don't like Neural Networks, and uh, I, I have tried, and I never like Neural Networks. So I'm not going to use it uh, in the near term. I mean, I do like them. The only problem is that m most people that I've seen that 
weren't happy about it is that because they, they didn't use enough data. And if you want to use the right amount of data, it takes forever to get the, the network to learn, uh, which again, they will take you down to a GPU path. So um, it depends, it purely depends. Okay. I do know that like back propagation does work very well, but you know you need to to go through like a few thousand, hundred thousand lines of uh, rows of data just to get some decent uh, learning paths. I do prefer, for example, decision trees, much more stable, and you can also explain them through propagation uh, trees. So I I think. I think we're at a point where we're starting to lose people. Uh, oh, um, do you want to just take, I'll keep saying, one last question. Let, let's uh, keep this uh, question the last question, I think, from, uh, from John here. Bloomberg here. Yeah. I, I did use it and I like it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have uh, it's water, man. Yeah. Okay, that, okay. Okay, well, I guess I'll wrap it up then. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out. Thanks a lot for doing this, guys. It was really, really good. Cheers, dude. Oh, my pleasure. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying thanks, as you can see. Thank you all for yeah. coming. Yeah, thanks for coming on yeah, uh, to, to, to the uh, webinar. Um, we'll do another one really soon. Um, so we'll just give it out a wrap. Cheers, dude, man. Have a good night, all. Yeah. Yes, have a good night. Thanks, thanks for Bye -bye. coming on out. Have a good night. Later.